I'm Raj Kumar here again in Brussels at the European Development Days and joined by a very special guest, Simon Maxwell, I think known to many of us who follow uh, what happens in the international development arena. Simon, of course, is Senior Research Associate at the Overseas Development Institute, ODI, in the UK, a thought leader in his own right on issues in development, and we thought we'd grab a few minutes with you, Simon, to uh, get your sense on the big picture here, what's happening in terms of the development agenda that we're talking about here, here at European Development Days. Are we moving to this new model that's been heralded for a while? Where do we stand? Well, first of all, pleased to see you and thanks for inviting me and congratulations on the work you're doing. Thank you. Listen, I think we're at a really interesting moment in international development because we're on the cusp of a change in the international development agenda. For the last decade, more, we've been entirely driven by the Millennium Development Goals, by poverty reduction, primary health care in Mozambique, uh, education in Nicaragua, disaster relief uh, across the world. And we've made enormous progress. Uh, I've been in development now for something like 40 years. I don't take all the credit, but I think the, move, the, the developing countries themselves take the credit. But actually, aid works, development works, and we can see the impact in infant mortality and, and maternal mortality and nutrition and so on. So great success. And of course, there's still more to do. And as we start to think about the new goals post-2015, we absolutely mustn't forget those core poverty issues that have been so successful in political and in public mobilization and in delivery on the ground. But here's the thing, Raj. There's a but coming, I think. Here's the thing. We're on, we're on the point of seeing two things. First of all, more and more of the people who remain in poverty are going to be in middle-income countries. And although it's very important that they be lifted out of poverty, the responsibility of the international community has to be different in those countries. We have a big debate in my country, in the UK, about aid to India, for example. Big concentration of poverty and $300 billion worth of foreign exchange and a space program and a big international and an emerging power. How far is it, people ask this question, how far is it, quote, our responsibility to help and how far isn't it? So we're going to see a change in the way we talk about poverty. But there's then there's something else, which is that what we see is that more and more managing the world, managing the global economy, but also the planet, are becoming issues that are rising rapidly up the agenda. I work on climate change. And let me tell you, when I see the evidence about the short-term consequences of climate change, now very evident, the long-term impacts and the economic costs. You know, we have a drought in the US and it has an effect on food prices around the world which affects the poorest people. We don't tackle that problem, which is climate related in part, not all, then we fail. Sure, climate uh, change is here now, it's not a future issue. It right? turns out that the precautionary principle that we always used actually is not the driver we needed. We need, a, we need an immediate and urgent driver. And then you can add other problems. How do we make the global financial system work for everybody? The financial crisis in Europe the economic crisis in Europe has cost developing countries $300 billion in lost exports. How do we manage things so that we don't get these sudden shocks in the system? And then we can add crime and drugs uh, and foreign policy and arms sales and proliferation and a whole lot of other issues which are equally important. And in the session I ran this morning, which was about inequality, uh, we talked about domestic inequality in developing countries. Then we talked about international inequality. And I call for a vote. And I ask people to vote on the following question. Um, if you compare the domestic drivers of poverty and think the part that aid can play on the one hand and the international drivers of poverty and inequality and the need for action internationally at the other, uh, which is more important? Is, is aid more important than international or are they about the same or is international more important than aid? Overwhelmingly people said that the big issues that need tackling in the world are the international issues. Sure and that is this in for Europe, the biofuels mandate, the CAP, economic partnership agreements and trade, how we manage compensation for the crisis, what are we going to do about the food shock and the food facility. Now that's very interesting because we have a generation of people in development, you're probably one, I'm certainly one, yeah. who have been trained to deliver primary health care in Mozambique, right. not in my case but in principle. Sure. In the next round of development, the next generation, we need people who are going to understand how to deliver deals at global level. And so the most highly prized people in the world will be people who can deliver global consensus. That has a big implication for aid agencies sure. and development cooperation agencies mm -hmm. and for the people who train the people who work in those agencies. Sure, development professionals uh, in general. We're going course, to need yeah. a, different, a, different, a different profession of people. We used to know a lot about how to assess the marriage customs of tribals in northern Burma. 
what we're going to need in the future are people who can assess the tribal customs of people in the General Assembly. And that's a very interesting point. Now, what's interesting about this is that it is essentially a multilateral agenda because global collective action cannot be delivered by one country acting alone. Uh, we need to work together and we have some options. We have the UN as an option. Mm -hmm. The UN is really good at the political, at dealing with fragile states, mm -hmm. peacekeeping, but doesn't really have the money, doesn't really influence trade policy. Sure. We have the World Bank. The World Bank has, in principle, stacks of money, but it can't manage in this space which is entirely political. It can't deal very easily with human rights and abuse and violence against women and so on. And then we have the EU as the third big pillar of this international system as far as we're concerned. And by comparison with those other two, the EU has a political mandate. It has political dialogue with countries. It acts, it has a, an incipient foreign policy and military power. And it has the largest aid program in the world, it's not often realised, you know, that the European Commission, never mind the Member States, the European Commission delivers more aid than the World Bank and more aid just about than the whole of the UN. So this is a huge part of the international architecture. Absolutely. And I think are they the, getting it right? And the question we have to ask is, are they getting it right? <laughs> There's been a lot of progress. Yeah. A decade ago, people were very critical about EU delivery. Now we've got a commissioner, Andris Peebalds, who is delivering through Agenda for Change a new approach, growth, the private sector, social protection, but also this policy coherence agenda, which is really important. But you know what? I think the EU has a problem. There are too many silos. It's like looking out at an industrial landscape with the chimneys smoking here, there and everywhere. We work with the European Parliament quite a lot. The European Parliament has a development committee but the Development Committee doesn't really deal with trade, because that's somewhere else. It doesn't really deal with climate, because that's dealt with by the Environment Committee. It doesn't really deal with peace and security, because that's dealt with somewhere else. So when an organisation has silos, you can create nets between them and links between them. But it's sometimes worth asking yourself, have we got it right? Yeah. Now, we have a Development Commission, no, and we have a Commission as a whole, which lasts for another two years. So I think now's the time to start thinking about what the development agenda will be post-2015. Mm -hmm. Will it be more in the direction I've indicated? And yeah. if it is, well, that's an interesting question. What kind of commission do we need and what kind of organisation within the commission and what kind of support do we need from member states? And what part do we play as ordinary citizens? Some of us are European, some of us aren't. How, what part do we play in helping to generate the narrative, the conversation and the the, uh, the opportunities that will shape this new development agenda. We have the f power to be extremely, even more important than we already are in development. Even more of a friend, not just to Africa, but also to Asia and Latin America. We have the power to do that. We won't continue to have the power unless we evolve um, the offer, the proposition on the table and the infrastructure which underpins it. So that's my hope for the future. Let's not, let's do the old thing. Let's continue working on poverty reduction. It's not, it's old, but it's not an irrelevant agenda. But let's also keep an eye on the other agenda so we walk on two legs, not just one. It's a fascinating commentary. So much of the debate and development is about where we're sending the money, right? Uh, following the, the flow of funding, et cetera. And at the commission level, the debate around this uh, 100 billion euro seven year proposal. And what you're saying is, well, it's, it, it is the money, but it's also the infrastructure. It's the way we're organized. We've got to work at a much larger global level. The agenda has really changed. And that's a, a fascinating way to look at this. But you know, I think it, it, development ministers have a tough job because we're charging our taxpayers money real money that could be spent on schools and hospitals in our own towns and cities and villages to send abroad. They've got to be able to demonstrate results. So when our development ministers across the European Union and internationally talk about results and they talk about value for money, they're talking to us and they're talking to developing, they're also talking to taxpayers and it's not a trivial conversation at all. So their task is to deliver now and lead for the future. Yeah, a great task, a great mission. I thank you so much for joining us and being part of this conversation. It's a pleasure. It's nice to see you. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.